during the day and do home mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right, exactly. That's how some people well, I don't want to be so have to be going there. I right. have feeling of how you know yeah. Mike. Yep. I am. I can call a meeting of the Bethel Park Tech School Committee. Anyone who wishes to record or photograph the meeting, first notify the chair to be informed the public for Massachusetts Open Meeting Law, July 2010, which audio or video recording may not interfere with the meeting. Time, I would like to have everybody stand do the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance. United States of America to the Republic. One nation under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice. Okay, this, this meeting will be broadcast on YouTube. Channel of Reading of Bethel Volk Tech High School. Public comment. Friends are welcome during the public comment segment. segment. Please forward comments to the recording secretary at Maria Fadette at Reading of Bethel Volk Tech. Ed. No later than 3 p.m. on Monday, October 11, 2021. Are there any public comments? From Ms. Andrea Lomba. In the executive interfaith action of Southeastern Mass. Okay. I don't see her here, but she did say she would attend. Okay. But Thomas will recognize her public comment. Okay, we have the roll call. Mr. Durgan? Here. Here. Okay. Here. Marlon? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Reading and acceptance of the minutes of the August 10th, August 19th, and September 14th meetings. Is it approved? Made. Second. Is it further on the question? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? So voted. I'd like to take a motion, uh, motion to. Do the executive board minutes. So moved. Motion is made and seconded. Been on the question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? No voted. Okay, approval of bills. We have a bills warrant number 2203 in the amount of $810,785.22. I have a motion. Make a motion to pay the bills. Motion made. Second, put it on the question. Those in favor? Aye. Who we'll voted? Uh, we'll along, facilities management update. This time I'd like to call on Mr. Garuda. Director. To me. Um, we have tonight, and we've got slides to, to go along with a uh, presentation. Is uh, an update of uh, what we've accomplished uh, the past 12 months, basically from September of 2020 to August of 2021. Give everyone a good idea of what's been done here at the facility. Uh, the first one here is our athletic shed. This one was built here, it's on the south side of our uh, football field. Built all in house with uh, uh, CBTE teachers and students. This is the inside of it. Um, and you'll see it was uh, very well constructed. And here on the left side, you'll notice that the, the electrical component of it, because of the location of the, this shed here, it would have been way too costly to run any kind of lighting out here. And, uh, one of the electrical shop teachers, along with the students, did the research, and uh, we put up our own uh, little solar system. The roof of that uh, shed there, 
works uh, with the lights inside and outside of the shed and um, saving us the cost of running it via the utility and also having a future uh, build there. So that's off to them. They did a great job there. In the middle, you'll see all the football gear already stored in there and uh, it, it's being put to good use there. During the summer, uh, a lot of things happen here at Folk Tech. Uh, that's, that's our busiest period, believe it or not. So it's, it's when the students are here. You know, a lot of uh, employees come in, uh, new, new people, people move around the school. And you'll notice there on the upper left side, a special services office. That's where Aaron Tuzinski is now located. That whole office got redone. Just below it, um, you'll see that that is uh, the new human resource offices. That's where Pam Smith is now located. And directly behind her, uh, it's the middle picture. You see where Mr. Williams is talking. That's actually uh, Ms. Markey's office there. So all those offices got redone, uh, painted. And on the right side is Mr. Williams' office. That is the main office conference room. That had to be redone. The rug was way beyond its years. Uh, placed the rug, put in the floor, painted the walls there, and uh, brought this uh, main conference room up to, up to snuff here. It looks pretty good now. Next thing was the uh, collision and cosmetology study reports. We had both of these done over the past year, year and a half. Uh, this now allows us to be able to now go into cosmetology, allows us now to be able to go into collision and know what's right, what's wrong. Um, it gives us a master plan, it gives us a game plan, of what to do, what not to do in both of those shop areas and uh, going forward for years to come. Next one there is uh, automotive. That's a kinetic sound proof panels you see there. That shop there, if, if you're familiar with automotive, it's Mr. Uh, uh, Medeiros' shop, right beside Mr. Uh, Shepard's office. That, uh, that classroom there felt like you were in a cave every time you talked in it. And if you put a half dozen students in there, it got rather loud. So uh, we put in a kinetic uh, soundproof system. We ordered it, and this was installed in-house by our facility maintenance staff. And this is our amazingly beautiful main entrance garden, which I take a lot of pride in this one here. Uh, gives you that college atmosphere feeling when our students, and our staff, teachers, and parents come through our school. This, was, this picture was actually taken uh, 6.30 in the morning a few weeks ago coming into to school. It looks really amazing there. Uh, an entranceway worthy of our school. Continuing on here, collision shock. So part of that study that we saw, um, there, there were a couple of ventilation issues. Um, one of the ventilation issues in collision uh, was at their welding stations. They have seven welding stations that you can see in front of us there, um, and there was no um, actual ventilation for them. So we installed the ventilation uh, system. Mr. Morell and his students installed it. Completely installed by our, our kids, our, our students, our, our staff, and uh, we punctured a hole in the roof. And now that entire welding station now has a uh, adequate and proper ventilation system in collision. We'll hop over to electrical. Uh, this is the freshman shop. Uh, these electrical workstations, if you've ever been there, after a, a certain amount of years of uh, the students pounding nails and staples into all of, all that you see there that is wooden, it starts to fall apart. It starts to fall apart, um, and it's, it's not usable any longer. So part of our summer work was to take all of those apart and rebuild those uh, from scratch. Staying in electrical, uh, we moved over to the senior area. On the left side there, that was just a, uh, an abandoned little area beside the staircase there. We built a brand new storage area built by our carpentry division again, painted by our painters in the summertime. And in that same shop to the right there, it uh, doesn't look like much, but it's those little uh, stands you see there. It's those little white stands. That allows the students, while they're working 
every one of those base, they get to put their manuals there and whatever they need to do their, their job uh, appropriately. And they can go back to the manuals, find out if they're doing their work the right way. So those were built at the same time for the seniors. Uh, this is our den, the, uh, the, the books, uh, books, so I apologize, the school store. Um, this picture does it no justice. So everyone, if you have a chance when you walk out, business uh, shop is doing an amazing job and in, in, in outfitting it right now. It's probably like 75% outfitted. The clothing looks amazing. It's right outside my office, so I'll be honest with you. I'm excited every time I look at this. This was a lot of hard work to get this accomplished. Work from our staff, carpentry students, electrical. Uh, a lot of hard work went in here, and I think we're we're close to seeing the opening about then. Okay, hey, this is our electrical sophomore shop. Uh, this house here, if you uh, haven't been there. Take a look at it. Um, you, you'll see the difference between what you see now, obviously, and what's there now. This house had been there now for 12 years. And just like those workstations, what happens is the students, they run electrical throughout this house. And that's how they learn, whether they're in, in the kitchen, they're, they're in a bathroom, whether they're upstairs in a bedroom. And so this is actually a, a clone of a house out in the field. It hadn't been replaced in about 12 years. Uh, so we replaced it this summer. See the next picture. It'll just show the students and Mr. Gonzalez on the left side building the, the house up. And the picture on the right is actually a picture bit complete. Uh, they did a great, great job. And um, that'll be there for the next, uh, God willing, next 10 to 12 years. One of the other things that we've been working on actually on a yearly basis, uh, and it started with Mr. W having a conversation with Mr. Williams nearly three to four years ago, was about single occupancy restrooms. And we've been installing them throughout our building slowly but surely every year. And uh, this is our 5115. That's just outside of uh, Ms. Stewart's office. If you'll notice on the right side, we usually have a door there that would say men's room. So what we did actually is just take that door out, push it back 10 feet, leaving the inside private bathroom open to the public. We converted the single one into a single occupancy restroom. So now any student can utilize that bathroom, uh, any adult can utilize that bathroom. And we have 15 single occupancy restrooms located throughout our school. Part of what we do um, not only maintaining and, and cleaning the, the uh, building is, is making sure that we have safe um, restrooms. And part of the safety component of it was installing partitions for sinks and urinals throughout the whole building. I dare say 95% of our bathrooms right now have sinks, have partitions, whether it's in between sinks and or uh, the urinals. Bathroom partitions. Uh, we replaced three bathroom partitions this year in the school. They're getting older. You know, we have a 1975 uh, facility here, 76, 77. And what's happening is uh, a lot of the older partitions are falling apart and, and they need to get replaced now. We do a couple every year. And so we did three more this year. And I expect to do another three this upcoming year. This is one of our bigger projects that we've completed. This was uh, the brand new visual design shop. We took Mr. Johansson's uh, room once he retired. Now we created two rooms from his one room. This is Mrs. Hippolito's side. This is the, the room now completed. This is what it did now, if you remember, uh, Paniatos, his old room, it was all open and all the students were in there together. Now this gives it some sort of privacy for each classroom by constructing that wall in the middle, but yet left a door and openings near the windows so that they can traverse and still communicate with each other. And this is Mr. Paniatos' side. And what we did on the right side, you can see there, we, we blew open a hole in a concrete wall so that he could have access to all his printers and everything he needed for his shop. Maintenance garage, 100% complete. Um, here you'll see pictures of uh, 
Electrical teaches its students. We've got plumbing, we've got carpentry down the bottom. Um, and you can see them all in action build, building our building. This is the inside of the building. You can see on the left side all the tools going in. It's not yet organized, but everything's in there uh, at this picture here. And the picture on the right is a picture of the rear of the building. This is the front of it. Uh, right now, it's actually got some uh, bushes and, and, and trees planted on the front. It actually softened it up very nicely. And every time we drive by here, see yourself, this building here, besides the concrete and the asphalt, was all built by Boke Tech. The entire thing was built by our staff, CBTE instructors, and our students. A lot to be proud of here. AC unit 26 and 31, you probably hear, heard me talk about this. This was a unit that uh, failed us about a year and a half ago. Uh, this unit's the one that's located at Marine Shop and Welding Shop. These are the roof units that were installed for that same project. And the final project. This is the electrical switch gear project. This was uh, the granddaddy of them all. Uh, this is when we shut the power down to the building. On the left, you'll see our old uh, switch gear as they were starting to take all the panels off of it. Now, this one, I'll be honest with you, this one gave me anxiety when I showed up. That on the left in the parking lot is our old switch gear. And I said, dear God, how are we going to put this back together? And you know what? Amazing job. But the contractors and our staff building this thing. These are all the wires. Uh, going all through HVAC shops at the time for, for this switch gear. This is the crew, the uh, company that came that came in and uh, built the switch gear in action. A lot of computer techs and electrical engineers that were here spent many hours. Remember, we were working 24 hours a day for nearly 10 days to get this project uh, completed. And this is uh, uh, Matt Whitlow, who uh, works for us in uh, he does an amazing job for us, and he was integral in helping out getting this project completed. And this is the final picture of our switch gear project. Uh, switch gear project uh, that you know will last us, you know, for the next 30, 40 years, uh, a long, long, long time here. Uh, so everyone got an idea, a, a taste of all the projects that we've done the past 12 months here. There are others, smaller ones that we didn't make the list here, so make this as short as possible. Any questions? <laughs> Just a great job. I, it's awful hard to rebuild some things during the process. I mean, really a time limited without the kids around. And, uh, but again, it seems like it was a good team effort. Uh, it is. I followed through Mike and everybody else, and it seems like whatever you needed, you can do it once. Good job all around because one thing we do say this building is a beautiful building, but we got to keep it that way. Yeah, and I, I just want to thank you, Mr. Shan. I want to thank Mr. Ruder and the team uh, for their work on this. Um, as he's alluded to, the building is 40, 50 years old uh, at this point. And so a lot of the things that are original are starting to go. So for us to make sure that we protect this for the next 40 to 50 years is going to require us to make those investments. Uh, in the infrastructure. And so I appreciate uh, Zeb's five year capital outlook plan, which I've been briefed on. I think it's solid and strong, it addresses those issues that are uh, most paramount to us in the short term. Um, and I think the team has done a really great job uh, making sure the operations continues in the midst of all that work. So please extend my thanks as well. Oh, thank you, Mr. Watson. Just another comment on that electrical switch here project. The young man that was uh, supervising that was a former student. He was. He was. He was a student again. Yeah. One of my students. So I know. Kind of proud of the fact that you know he's done very well. He's very happy with his uh, training here and moved on quite well. And he's a supervisor so contract. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Any other questions, comments? Okay, no action need on day taken on that. Uh, MCAS presentation, Mr. Angelo, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Toomey, members of the committee. 
Uh, just a couple of um, background information before we get into the actual results, uh, into the actual data. Uh, as you're probably aware, in uh, 2020, there was no MCAS test across uh, the state due to schools being shut down, COVID, the Department of Ed um, canceled the MCAS test last year. So uh, this past year, 2021, um, grade 10 students did have to take the test for uh, MCAS graduation purposes. And any student that was in a grade 11 last year could take the test for um, Adam scholarship purposes. So the results you're gonna see here tonight are strictly the grade 10 students, which are the students that have to take the test in order to meet the competency determination in order to get a diploma uh, at the end of their senior year. So what was different in 2021? Uh, just to kind of uh, bring you back a little bit, the last time we did the test in 2019, uh, we actually elected to take the next generation uh, test, which is the new MCAS test, also known as MCAS 2.0, that had been phased in over the years. And in 2019, we had a choice to either take the old version of the test or to take the uh, next generation, which is uh, solely computer based. The only time you can give a paper test as if the student has an accommodation. So we gave the computer based test. It is the next generation. And just for your own information, uh, we've all gotten used to the old MCAS scores being 200 to 280. The new test is scored totally different. Uh, they no longer uh, refer to students in the warning failing category, needs improvement, proficient or advanced. They now give four different categories and they are not synonymous with the previous um, standings of warrant of warning failing or needs improvement. It's completely revamped new scoring and you see an explanation of each of the different categories and what that means. So a student that is not meeting expectations would score between a 440 and a 468. A student that's and partially meeting would be from 470 to uh, 498, so on and so forth. Also in 2021, even though schools did give the test and high schools had to offer the test, to sophomores because they will have to pass that test before they're, uh, uh, they're able to graduate, there was no accountability report. So in the past, we've always reported out on accountability. Where does our school stand in comparison to other schools? Where does it stand in the eyes of the state? In 2021, there is no accountability report. So this year's report is gonna be a little different. Uh, it is strictly about AMCAS scores. Uh, all our students did in comparison to the state and how the various subgroups also did it in comparison to uh, to the state. In both ELA and math, there was no science test in 2021. So, Marcel, you already have it up there. Perfect. Um, so, in ELA, in the all students category, and that number you see next to the title, 503, is actually the number of students that took the test. 503 sophomores took the test. There were roughly 50 sophomores that elected not to take the test last year. Uh, they are now scheduled to take it uh, in November as a makeup because they will need to pass the test in order to uh, get a diploma. So this is based on those 503 students uh, that took it last uh, spring. The bar on the left in the green is, is us, graded in depth and vocational. And the bar in orange is the state results across the state, strictly for, again, grade 10. So I combine these students that are meeting or exceeding the expectations, put that into one block, and you'll notice that for the all students category in English language arts, 50% uh, of our students met or exceeded the standards as compared to across the state, that percentage was 64% of, uh, of the students. On the flip side, on the opposite side, which is not meeting uh, standards, we had 7% of those 503 students that did not meet the standards, yet across the state, that percentage was higher. It was 9% of the students that did not meet uh, standards. On the left-hand side, uh, I put the two bars there of the average scale score for all students. So our average scale score was 499 points, 0.7. On, an, on average, just below that meeting expectations bar. 
the state was at 507.3. So their average across the state slightly higher than ours. To the right, the graph you see there is the mean student growth percentile. And the student growth percentile is really where we concentrate on here because unlike the scores where a student might come in uh, having been proficient in the past, maybe have, uh, comes in not meeting expectations in the past, the student growth percentile matches students with like scores throughout their MCAS history. So a student who scored, for example, a 500 in their eighth grade test, during the 10th grade test, they get matched up um, with those students that scored 500. And then what the state does is they look at the student that improved from eighth to the 10th the most, that student be at the 99th percentile, the student that did not improve or actually went down in the score might be in the one percentile. Somewhere between one and 99 is what every student gets for a uh, student growth percentile. What you see there to the right is our average student growth percentile. And what you will notice is that in the all category in ELA, we were slightly below the state. Had a mean student growth percentile of 49.6. The state outgrew us a little bit from 8th to 10th grade with a score of 52.5. Angela, I'm just going to interrupt there. Sorry, I just want the members to kind of zero in on that box as we flip through the slides. As Mr. Angelo mentioned that is the focal point for the district, right? Uh, it's, it's been my focal point for several years. I believe that, I, that we can do as, as well as any school, the Commonwealth, when it comes to growing kids, wherever they come. They come in with scores of 470 or 520. They get compared to like performers. And I'm willing to bet on our folks being able to grow our kids at a rate that's faster than everybody else in the state. And so while that number doesn't look perfect for us tonight, you'll see the subgroups as we flip through this that I think are particularly revealing about some of the work we've done with economically disadvantaged kids, students with disabilities, language learners. Um, students that, that fall in different demographic groups. I want to I want to make sure that interrupt one time, point you into that corner um, as we flip through each of these slides because that is the district goal. And for 2021, our SGP goal is 52. We can we can do that. We've done it before, and now that we're back on track, that that should be our focal point as a district. That is my smart goal. It's Principal Williams' smart goal, and we passed on to folks who are starting in plans as well. Thank you. So awesome. Bias, if you can move. Next slide. So out of those 503 students that took the test, 283 of those students are classified by the Department of Ed. Uh, that's one of us, our groups, as high-need students. Now, what is a high-need student? A high-need student is either a student who is economically disadvantaged, is a student that's on an IEP, or is an English learner, or a combination of any of those three. You will notice that that number is 283 students, which makes up slightly over 56% of the population that took the test. These would be your most challenging subgroups as defined by the Department of Ed. So when we compare the results of the high-need students here at Vote Tech for the CLA test compared to the high-need students uh, across the state, you will notice that our high-need students actually outperformed high-need students across the state. We have 42% of our high need students that either met or exceeded expectations. And when you look at the opposite end of the spectrum, the students that did not meet expectations, we had 11% of those students, whereas the state had 19% of the high need students not meet expectations. So almost a two to one ratio of not meeting expectations on the state side. You'll notice that the average scale score kind of reflects that. Our average scale score for the high needs subgroup was actually two points, or 2.5 points higher than the state. And again, as Mr. Watson pointed out, more importantly, high need students outgrew state high need students. Again, that's a comparison of apples to apples, eighth grade to 10th grade. So we're very proud of the fact that that particular subgroup outperformed the state. If you flip onto the next slide, uh, I then broke out those three subgroups. Again, high needs can be any one of those three, could be economically disadvantaged, can be a student on IEP, or it can be an English learner. So what we're looking at is strictly those students that are economically disadvantaged. And of that number that you saw earlier, 283, 224 of those students 
uh, fall into this category of economically disadvantaged. Again, these students outperform the state. We have 48% of our economically disadvantaged students meet or exceed uh, on the test versus 41% across the state. Just as important on the opposite end, the not meeting, we had 9% of those students not meet where the state had 19%, more than double uh, our percentage. The, to the left, you will see the scale score. Again, our scale score is about five points higher uh, than the state. Again, just as importantly, our high need students outgrew the high need students across the state. Flip to the next slide. The second group within that um, high need student, strictly students with dis uh, students with disabilities. These are students on IEPs. Twelve percent of our students uh, scored in the meet and exceeds twenty five percent across the state. So across the state, the state had double percentage of students with disabilities uh, meet or exceed. What's interesting when you look at the opposite end. Even though our sampling compared to the state is much smaller, we're only talking 52 students. The percentages are identical, both at 28% not meeting uh, standards. If you look to the left, the average skill score for students with disabilities here at Oak Deck, uh, they're about 5.3 points uh, lower on average. What is interesting is our students with disabilities slightly outgrew students with disabilities across the state. So how can that be? How can the state be performing at 25%? We're performing at 12, yet our growth is slightly higher. What that tells us is students coming into the building, students with disabilities come in with a much lower um, scale score than students with disabilities across the state. Yet they are growing at the same rate as students with disabilities across the state. So they're keeping up with their um, with their counterparts, we obviously want to concentrate a little bit more on that so that that percentage of students that meet and exceeds actually was higher. So we're going to look to grow that student growth percentile for students with disabilities. The third group within that um, I need student English language learners. Um, our really English language learners were actually uh, 32 students that took that test. Of those 32 students, 13% scored on the meets or exceeds post of state only 4% of the LL students uh, scored in the uh, meets or exceeds. The opposite end of the spectrum, 44% of our that group of our English language learners did not meet expectations. And you'll notice that the state is 64%, almost two thirds of every English language learner across the state does not meet standards on the English test in grade 10. That's any student who's an English learner, learner who's been in the country for at least one year. They must take the test. If you look to the left again, you'll notice that our scale score is over 10 points higher than the uh, English learners across the state. More importantly, our English learners here at Oak Tech on the English test are outgrowing their counterparts across the state by almost 10 percentage points. We're at 40, 48.4, where the state is at 39.8. So that's that's a great bar to look at. Uh, our English learners are certainly outgrowing their counterparts across the state. If you flip to uh, the next slide, uh, I actually took those English learners and also added them to the former English learner. Because once an English learner tests out of the program, you kind of lose the story of that student. The student is proficient enough do not have that label of English learner, but how are they doing? So this is another subgroup that the Department of Ed actually tracks. That's a combination of those students you saw on the previous page, plus students that have transitioned out of the program. And again, you'll notice that English learners and former English learners together are outperforming the state 29% versus 19. And when you look at the not meeting, our students are about half uh, of the state's not meeting population. We have 21% where the state is at 41%. The left again, you will see our scale score, average scale score for these students is much higher than the states. And you'll notice that the student growth percentile for this group is over six points higher than the state. So these students are growing 
they're outgrowing their counterparts uh, across the state. Yeah. Slide, thank you. Uh, white students, we had 284 of the students that took the test uh, are in our demographics profile as white students. Again, this particular group, just like the all um, category, did not perform as high as the state. We have 53% of our white students that scored in the meets and exceeds versus the state at 73. On the not meeting, we had one percentage point higher than the state, whereas 6% of our white students that did not meet uh, standards on this test were as uh, that number is 5% across the state. Again, to the left, you'll notice that our average scale score for white students is about 11 points lower than the state. When we look at the student growth percentile, again, our white students are not growing at the same pace as white students across the state. So that's an area that we're uh, going to look at. That's an area we're going to focus because, as Mr. Uh, Watson stated earlier, we certainly believe that our students can grow at the same rate as the state, if not faster. We have seen other subgroups uh, perform at a much faster rate, much faster rate. For African American students, um, story kind of reverses, and that's the um, African American students. Again, those students that are in our demographic um, profile as African American, those are 35 students. Those students performed at 50% rate of meeting and exceeding versus the state at 41. And more importantly, only 2% of those students did not meet expectations, whereas at the state, it's 16%. So much lower percentage here at Greater Bedford Gold Tech. On the left-hand side, once again, you'll notice that our score, outscore is the state for this particular subgroup. The student growth percentile, African-American students here at this school are outgrowing African American students across the state at a 53.5 to 46.4 completion. For Hispanic and Latino students, and uh, I would also, uh, again, this is self identified. This is what's in our demographic data. Uh, you'll notice that that number of Hispanic and Latino students, 133 students, that number has been growing uh, over the past few years. More importantly, our Hispanic and Latino students outperformed the state 43% meeting expectations, meeting or exceeding versus the state at 39. And their average skill score was over four points higher than, than the state. More importantly, that growth, our Hispanic and Latino students are outgrowing Hispanic and Latino students across the state. So that gives you a snapshot of the ELA results. Ran the exact same information for the math test so that we can do an apples to apples comparison. Same subgroups. So um, you look at that slide math all students again, 503 students uh, took the test. You'll notice that 38% of our students either met or exceeded expectations, whereas 52% met it or exceeded across the state. What's interesting is when you look at the not meeting, uh, we had half of the percentage. We only had 6% of our students not meet uh, versus 12% of the state. And um, certainly what one can conclude by looking at some of these uh, graphs is that we do a really, really good job uh, with those students that come in with both scores, support those students, and we get them to grow, we get them to, uh, to meet standards, where that might not have been the case before they into this building. So when we look at the at the average scale score, the all students here uh, did not score as high as the state. What's interesting is if we look at the growth, uh, we actually outgrew the state. So once again, our kids come in with a much lower score, but they are growing faster than students uh, across the state. So that's that's a really uh, positive piece that I think we want to look at. Looking at that high needs population in combination of any of those three subgroups, economically disadvantaged, IEP students are ELL. Uh, once again, our high needs students outperform the state when it comes to meeting and exceeding. And when you're looking at the students not meeting, 
we had 9% of those students that did not meet expectations on the math and pass test, which is 24% across the state. So that's a huge difference there. Average scale score, once again, we're almost five uh, points higher in, uh, in that particular subgroup. And when you look at the mean student growth percentile, you will notice that our high need students are outgrowing high need students across the state by a pretty significant margin. 32.7 for the state versus 43.7 for our students. Breaking out the economically disadvantaged. This again, uh, it kind of repeats itself. Our economically disadvantaged students outperform the state. It meets and exceeds. And when you're looking at the not meeting, our percentage is much, much lower. We only have 7% versus the state is at 24%. And our average scale score for the subgroup is higher than the state. When you look at the meet, uh, at the mean student growth percentile, we are growing at a much, much faster rate in mathematics. Students with disabilities. Only 5% of our students with disabilities either hit the meet or exceeds mark on, uh, on this particular uh, MCAS test. 14% was the percentage across the state. When you look at the not meeting, we had a much lower percentage than, uh, than the state not meeting. We had 26%. State had 36. Our scores are pretty close for the average scale score or about a point lower. But yet, once again, our students with disabilities outgrew students with disabilities across the state. For English learners, only 6% of those students hit the meets or exceeds versus the state, only 4% of those uh, English learners hit the meets or exceeds target. And the not meeting expectations, we had 19% of our kids not meet, and you notice at the state that percentage is 56%, which is pretty incredible. Once again, our average scale score is higher than the state, and if you look to the graph on the right, that bar graph, our student growth for English language learners in mathematics just completely blows the state out of the water. Um, 31 for the state and we're at 51.8. So incredible work, particularly with English learners uh, when it comes to mathematics classes. Looking at the ELL and former ELL, uh, it pretty much repeats itself. We once again have a higher percentage of students at the meets and exceeds and a much lower percentage of not meeting. We have 10% of our students versus the state at 39%. Our average scale score higher than, than the state. And once again, the student growth is much, much higher than the state. We're at 50, state is at 33.9. White students, we have 42% at meets and exceeds versus the state at 60. What's interesting is when you're looking at the not meets, we're actually one percentage point lower than, than the state. 6% of our Students did not meet or, or uh, did not meet the standards. State is at seven percent. Our scale score is lower, but you'll notice that our student growth is much higher once again. State. So again, you know what we keep concentrating on is that student growth. How are our kids matching up against the state? Help establish comparison, and our students, for the most part, uh, are outgrowing their counterparts. African American students. Once again, our African American students outperformed the state African American students, and the percentage of not meeting uh, was only two percent versus the state of twenty-three. Our scale score is higher, and the mean student growth percentile for African American students again much much higher here at the school forty-six point one versus thirty-two point three uh, at the state. Hispanic and Latino students, uh, once again. Those students outperform their state counterparts when it comes to meet and exceeds. And when it comes to not meeting, we only have 8% of those students there and 26% at the state level. Our average scale score is higher and our growth, as you'll notice, uh, the state is only at 30.4 on the graph. It pretty much just a very slight blip on there and our students are at 44.8. So we are outgrowing. Um, our Hispanic Latino students are outgrowing their counterparts across the state um, by a huge, huge margin. So what does all that mean? Um, obviously, one difference this year is the state did not 
uh, rank schools. They did not give us uh, percentiles so that we could compare uh, this school to other schools. So what we did is we looked at our average skill score. You will notice on that particular slide that the state is about third from the top. Um, that's an average scale score of 507. Our average scale score uh, was lower with 499.7. So our kids come in with a lower score. They are scoring lower, lower than um, state across the board. When you look at vocational schools and strictly vocational schools, and this is us compared to every vocational school across um, across the state based on last year's ELA MCAS, we're about eight from the bottom. So that is certainly an area that we want to look at. We want to bring that score up compared to other vocational schools. Uh, Principal Williams and I uh, had a little conversation about some of these results. And uh, Mr. Williams you know, reminded me that last year was a COVID year, it was a challenging year, and our conversation pretty much led to the next day of being well. It was challenging for everybody. So that is certainly something we want to look at, and we want to see that go up a little. When we look at the math scale score, uh, Green Beth of Vogue Tech is pretty much uh, in the center, pretty much in the middle of vocational schools. You'll notice that the state's average scale score in, in math uh, was actually much higher than vocational schools. Across the state, uh, this test was an issue. You read some of the newspapers, listened to some of the stories. Uh, a lot of students struggled this past year. Certainly, their educational experience the past year and a half is not what um, perhaps should have been due to COVID. When we look at the um, student growth percentile, I think I might have skipped one. Okay. Um, the math student growth percentile at Brandon and Beth of Oak Tech ranks the second highest amongst vocational schools. So if our students are growing this much in mathematics, certainly we believe that they can also grow in, in ELA. So we'll look at ELA a little bit. We're very proud of, of the fact that our students were the second highest growing across the state when we compared to other vocational schools. Also looked at some of the local high schools and when I say local high schools, pretty much uh, demographically, um, just compared us to any high school in the area. You'll notice schools such as Old Rochester uh, Regional, Diamond High School, Somerset Berkeley, we just wanted to get a sense of, you know, how did COVID impact students? How did it impact us students versus our students, uh, other students rather? And you will notice that Great New Beth Vogue Tech in uh, ELA, we ranked the third uh, from the bottom in scale score compared to local high schools. If you look at student growth, we were uh, four from the bottom. So again, that's an area we want to look at. That's an area we want to grow. When you look at the math scale score, the importance here is even though our math scale score is slightly below the state, this particular instance where two thirds from the top or kind of like that, that bottom third. But when you look at student growth, it's again, second highest growing compared to if you can go to the next uh, slide. We're the second, uh, second highest growing one compared to other local high schools. So by and large, I think the, um, the story is a pretty favorable one. Uh, there are some areas that we certainly want to look at, uh, and we want to make sure that, like Mr. Watson said, that our students are not only growing at the same rate as some of their counterparts, but in some cases, we want them to grow a little faster. I just want to add, thank you, Mr. Angelo. Um, so that we're real clear about this um, from the district perspective. The average skill score is something that we can't necessarily control. Our kids come through the door, they, they are what they are. Um, and we need to work with the kids that, that are admitted into the school. So I've made the same case to the accountability folks at, at the Department of Ed. I don't think it helps urban districts across the state. They're never gonna be able to get uh, from the bottom of the accountability system if that counts for the lion's share of the, of the, of the, of the ranking. Because kids come in, with different home lives, different backgrounds, and different abilities. The test, the average skill score is the test score. Where we, where we focus is on the SGP. 
uh, because that is going to drive the average scale, scale score anyway. The better you do in the SGP, you're going to get more opportunity for the kids. They're going to have better educational outcomes, better opportunities for scholarships. That's where our focus is. And I want to emphasize that except for white students in ELA, every statistical demographic group, our SGP score in English and math outperformed the state average. That is something for us to celebrate. That is something for our folks, our teachers, in the middle of a COVID pandemic, uh, and everybody faced. Everybody faced that. We were able to get our kids to grow at a faster rate than the state average. So we should, we should be proud of that, celebrate that. And while there's clearly learning loss and there's clearly opportunities for us, the data point that every high school kid in Massachusetts faced results for Greater New Bedford Vote Tech. Are something that we should be proud of. We all work to do. There's no, there's no question about it. But we should be proud of, of, of what we were able to do amidst a global pandemic. Questions of Mr. Angelo and Mr. Watson. Comments. And no action needed on that. Uh, moving right along, Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Toomey. Uh, as I started last. Um, Last month, I want to take a moment briefly at every school committee meeting to kind of shout out and call out folks who have gone above and beyond uh, the call of duty in the prior month. And there are always going to be several examples of people that I can I can do that with. Uh, but tonight, I want to celebrate two different areas of the building. First, I want to shout out for Janet Stanton. I think in academics uh, every day, she has helped organize a difficult situation, which we're going to talk about later tonight with substitutes and substitute pay to get coverage into our classrooms, to try to maintain this continuity for kids on an everyday basis with our folks who are being asked to jump into, into classrooms. It's a tall order, it's frustrating for teachers. Uh, Janet has to be the front line to that each and every day. So I wanna, I wanna call that out and single that out and thank her for her efforts and what I know is a difficult situation. And secondly, last Friday, as I wrote in my weekly letter to the staff, I was able to visit over 20 CBTE classrooms on kind of a spur of the moment thing. I focused a lot on some of our exploratory classrooms. I could literally single out six or seven folks uh, from Paul Estrella to Jeff Wildrick to Rick Quinton, Aaron Marcotte, and the list goes on and on of classrooms. I literally popped in and out of uh, for two or three minutes just to say hi to the teachers, thank the teachers for their work, meet the kids as they go through the exploratory process. The work was exceptional and phenomenal. Passionate folks in the classrooms trying to convey their expertise in their respective programs to kids. Um, nobody knew I was going. I didn't tell anybody on the administration and tell anybody in the building. So it was kind of an opportunity to just kind of see things in real time. Uh, to say that I was pleased with that uh, would be an understatement. And so deeply grateful to our CBT teachers who I saw last Friday. All of you know that I was there. Uh, you did a great job. Kids were engaged in the classroom. And to Ms. Stanton for keeping this ship moving on the academic side under very difficult circumstances with, cl with class coverage. Uh, that's this month. Those are the folks I, I want to call out. And I stress again that I could literally talk about this for 10 or 15 minutes with the work people are doing each and every day uh, on behalf of our kids. Thank you. Okay. Any comments or questions of Mr. Watson on a shout out? Uh, right. As we know, at the end of last year, we were a bad year. I think this is good. I, I like to keep it going. And I want to add our, you know, touch to the school committee people. I, I talked to Pat, I talked to Fred, I talked talk to Randy. We all talk. And, and we, are, we understood what went on. And we understand that you being positive at this meeting, you know, every month we're going to hear something that we can't see. Right along the weekly uh, updates in your packets really briefly. I just included all of the weekly newsletters that go out at the beginning of the week. I'm trying to focus on making sure that the staff is hearing directly from me at the top of their email box when their week starts uh, on Monday morning, trying to highlight just 2 or 3 things. The goal is 1 page uh, just to kind of emphasize things that I think are important for them to know directly from me every week. So I included a copy of all those weekly newsletters in your packet and we'll continue to do so. Right, Questions, comments, action need to be taken on that. 
Okay, on the advisory dinner, uh, Mr. Watt. Yeah. We're still gonna do a full in-person advisory on October 22nd. We will not have our usual dinner in the cafeteria. For this meeting, we will take a takeaway buffet will be served. This will alleviate the members from having to take off their mask for more than 15 minutes in the cafeteria. Members will take their dinners to their career and technical areas where they will socially distance for dinner and mask up for the meeting. At this time, we have decided it is the safest route for us to go and still meet in person because we really feel that they need to meet in person and be in their career and technical areas. Questions? Okay, please. October 22nd. Okay. 20th. 20th. Check. October 20th. Yes. Yeah. October 20th. Wednesday, next Wednesday. Sorry? That's right. You could have any Friday night meal, but I don't always <laughs> yeah. No, I know it. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Should be taken. Uh, Principal Williams. Yeah, well, there was a NIA. So I just was going to say all of our CVT areas and academic areas have responded to the visiting team's recommendations as well as their statuses. Now concentrate on the seven standards of overall recommendations and accommodations. This is where we would develop a plan to complete all of the recommendations for our five year focus visit. Some of these things are already in progress, such as reinstatement of our general advisory committee and other things. But we continue to move forward and finish this by the five year month. Questions of Mr. Watt? Sorry about that, Mr. Watt. Okay. Okay, now Mr. Williams, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Toomey, members of the committee. So I'd like to turn your attention to the artisan report and your packets. In this audit and report, however, committee meeting, we'll go over this introduction of some staff member, members of the school, highlights of some of the great things that are going on throughout the building, particularly with this audit and report. I'll talk about what the assistant principals in the security department have done to start the year, what's going on in Academy B, and also the math department and outside instruction. So, first, assistant principals in the security department. This is the principal along with the security department in the SRO. So Leanne Fisher had a busy start to the school year. During the first week of school, the team presented eight class meetings. A list of topics included but not limited, suspensions and expulsion, bus expectations, parking lot expectations, appropriate use of technology, bullying, and Alice lockdown training. In addition, the team held a bus driver training where all districts bus drivers were fully checked. Given general training information and had questions answered for the upcoming school year. This month, the team will conduct a rear door bus evacuation drill where students will be trained on how to leave a bus quickly and safely. In the event. It will actually take place next Friday during our half day, which is dovetailed with our development. And our round. She just sent that email out to all staff, so you'll see that schedule. Culinary Arts. So after being closed for over a year due to COVID, the Lighthouse Cafe is now serving breakfast and lunch to staff and faculty. The students are excited to have this aspect back to, back to further, back to further their experience and knowledge of live work. Food is great. So medical assisting, Laura Coturley has joined this program as a sophomore instructor. She is a former graduate of the medical assistant program. We are excited to have her as part of the team. She brings valuable work experience to the classroom. Brenda Carvalho, Marcy Latender, and Ted Haggerty have worked diligently and tirelessly to ensure all senior students have been placed in co-op and placement positions. COVID still presents many challenges for us, but we are confident it will be a great, great year for the students out in their co-op experiences. Nurse Assisting Program. Students in this program continue to work through the many challenges of COVID to provide exceptional bedside care to many patients while on co-op. Once again, we had, we had a 100% pass rate for the certified nurse assistant examination at the end of the school year. This is a testament to the hard work of all the instructors in this program. Early childhood education. The preschool classes 
are in full swing this year, providing the four and five year olds with creative lesson plans and fun. Some return to normalcy. The high school students can once again use the entire campus while implement when implementing lessons such as scavenger hunts, etc. Both preschool classes are at capacity as usual with a waiting list to enter the program. Just have to say the scavenger hunts if you haven't seen them in the <laughs> Cups to the ECE teachers and students. Dental assistant. The instructors are excited to learn much needed up-to-date equipment will be purchased with Perkins funding. This has been a request of the, of the advisory board for many years. The students are excited to start using the equipment as it will provide experience with equipment used in the dentist offices. COVID continues to pose challenges in this allied health field as with many other careers. Most of the senior students have been placed in co-op or placement positions. Legal and protective services. Kyle Gosson has joined the LPS team as the junior instructor. Brings great work experience to the classroom. We are fortunate to have him here at Greater New Bedford. LPS students are once again working with the GNV security team to provide inside security duties as a means of learning soft skills before working in co-op or placement capacity. The senior students will obtain their 911 training this year. With COVID restrictions last year, the program was canceled. Math department. Please welcome Bridget Taylor, William Rocher to the math department. He has spent multiple years at Dartmouth High School and is certified in high school mathematics and special education. Has prior experience at New Bedford High School and Pontiquit Regional High School. Both have completed the Shelter to English Immersion Enforcement certification process. The math department is working diligently to plan and deliver rigorous and engaging instruction. We're so happy to have our students back for in. Uh, 2021 MCAS results do not count toward district accountability. The math department is particularly proud of our performance when compared to the overall data for the state. The data shows GNB Voctex math students outperform the state's growth performance for all students and across subgroups. The mean SGP for all students was second to only Shawshine Valley among all vocational schools in the state. In addition, Greater New Bedford Voctex students were second only to Aponiquit among the South Coast Area High School. Congratulations to all faculty, staff, students, and administrators for helping deliver these results in the midst of a global pandemic, primarily via remote learning since March 2020. Finally, community outreach. Senior carpentry students, number of uh, pictures of, of the student work that we've done out in the community. The student carpentry students were at Buttonwood Park in New Bedford and saw the backboards in the tennis court area. Backwards were, backboards were made during the pandemic and could finally be installed. The installation was completed in late September. The students were joined by Richard Larry for a photo, photo op in front of the completed park you see him at the tennis courts. They look really good. The carpentry seniors rebuilt the roof of the Veterans Memorial Gazebo at the Dartmouth Council on Aging. Work was slated for last year, but was delayed due to COVID-19 pandemic. I had the pleasure of going out and seeing their work they did a great job out there. So kudos to the outside construction crew, the math team, Academy B, and also our assistant principals in the security team to keep this place safe and sound. Thank you. Any questions of uh, moving right along. Thank you, Mr. Watt, Mr. Williams. Student representative, our ever blessed young lady, Sarah. Um, thank you, Mr. Toomey. So, good evening, everyone. Um, so, a lot of things on the agenda today that's been happening um, around school. Um, so, to first start off with um, some recent things that happened um, is the senior fall back event. Um, so, if you listen to um, past meetings, you might have heard about it, but basically this was a fundraiser for our senior class um, to basically raise money for their prom. Um, it also kind of acted as a junior banquet kind of um, replacement since we didn't get one. It was just another kind of class thing that we could do. Um, the seniors got to bring an underclassman, um, so that was really fun to kind of engage the juniors as well, um, just because 
they're still struggling to find out if they're going to have a junior banquet. They're working towards it, but it's just something else to kind of bring up their spirits and hopefully give them a positive outlook on how their year is going to go as well. Um, another thing that is coming up pretty soon is the homecoming. Um, so this homecoming dance is going to be Hawaiian themed. Um, it's kind of sticking with the spirit week as well in the uh, pep rally theme, which is kind of Hawaiian theme. Uh, students have the choice if they want to dress up, they can dress up kind of Hawaiian if they like, but um, if not, they can wear whatever suit and tie or dress, whatever attire um, that they want to wear and just throw a lay over it if they want to take some pictures with some of the Hawaiian um, photo props. Um, also, something new to the homecoming is obviously because of COVID, um, we have to take our precautions. So it will be in the gym um, with masks, but there will be um, an option to go outside. So you can take like a mask break. There'll be um, cornhole out there. So kind of not just standing there boring. It'll be a couple games that you can do. Have a couple, you know, start a tournament or something if you really wanted to. You can do anything there. Uh, so that'll be really fun. Heading on to homecoming is the pep rally and the spirit week beforehand. Um, so unlike past years, we're having two spirit weeks this year. So we're going to have the spirit week going into our homecoming um, dance. And then also the week after is going to be a spirit week for the other division, which will be division one. And going into our Halloween game. So that just kind of gives students um, that are on co-op or maybe don't have the luxury of dressing up in their shops. Um, another opportunity to participate in the school function and um, just be a part of the school. Um, what else is next is the REITs Across America. So the Student Council um, is putting on a fundraiser um, along with the Skills USA um, kind of team and advisors. Uh, basically, this is a fundraiser competition and it's like a community service project where students of Skills USA and also really anyone that wants to join um, can help. Uh, veterans and also the military place wreaths across graves. Um, this is happening on December 18th and it's going to be kind of a great way for students and also staff and faculty to kind of humble themselves and be grateful for everything that these veterans have um, done for all of us here. Something else coming up soon um, next week, actually in the week after is the National Honor Society induction ceremony. So the current senior class their ceremony was supposed to be last year, but obviously due to COVID, it couldn't be. So this is a great way to um, get back onto track and not leave them in the dust. Don't, don't want to forget about them. <laughs> so their ceremony is going to be on October 19th at 6 p.m. And then the current junior class, their uh, ceremony is going to be on October 26th at 6 p.m. as well. Um, so the students are allowed to bring two guests, so that's really good. So whoever they want to bring, they can bring to share this special moment because it is a great honor to be a part of our national honor society um ask any advisor or even the students it takes a lot of hard work and effort to get into the national honor society so it's something definitely to be proud of uh, something else that happened over the last month was um the student mentors and also the entire sophomore class had the privilege to listen to chris heron um, he is a motivational speaker and former basketball, NBA basketball player. Um, and he spoke to the students about overcoming um, like addiction. It was a very, very touching. I personally got to um, see his speech. So it was, it was very touching personally. And I know other students, as we were walking back to class, you could hear in the halls and also in the classrooms about how it was touching. And it just it was very eye opening for the students. So I think it was a great experience. Um, and it was very nice to, to meet Chris and just have him come to our school and want to come to our school. So that was a great experience as well. And lastly, um, I don't know if this was an event put on by the football team themselves or the coaches or both of them, um, but something that kind of went on last week that I noticed and other um, faculty noticed was um, faculty were wearing the football players' jerseys. Um, and it wasn't just to wear it because there was a football game that Friday. It was because there was an actual um, great meaning behind it. So the football boys, they gave their away jerseys, so the gold jerseys, to a teacher that really made an impact on them. Um, this is a great message as it not only made the, like, the boys feel better, but it also made the 
the teachers and faculty, whoever got that jersey feel appreciated as well. Because as a student, we do want you to know that we do appreciate everything that you do for us. And I think this was a great um, way to kind of relay that message. So I know the staff um, and also the boys are very happy um, kind of put this whole, I guess, event on. Um, so that was really sweet to see around the school, just everyone. At first it was like, what's going on here? Why are there, the faculty, are they gonna be playing in the game? But then you kind of hear the message. You're like, wow, that's, that's really good. It's a very touching message. Um, so that is basically my student representative uh, report for the month of October. Are there any questions or concerns? You neglected one little thing. I, from what I understand, Mr. Williams spent a lot of time in a dump. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, it was great. I forget who dumped him, too, but it was, it was pretty good. His nickname is Tank. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty good. I think everyone was around there. No one else was on the field. Everyone was just kind of like, oh my gosh, Mr. Williams is in the dunk tank. Everyone just kind of runs over there. You know what I mean? <laughs> nice and refreshing, right? Refreshing. <laughs> that was an awesome night, though. Yes, it was really, it was a great turnout. Like a senior and um, as like the juniors that were there, it was, or underclassmen, it doesn't just have to be juniors. It was just a great way to just kind of get back to normalcy and have like a fundraiser that didn't really feel like a fundraiser. It was just something fun. You know what I mean? So that was really fun. To... Oh, also, I don't know if any of the people over there um, heard the last couple meetings, but I finally brought my back. <laughs> what is Dory? If you guys wanted to see, I've been meaning to to bring it in. I've been slacking. I was on co-op last time, so I wasn't able to bring it in. But there you go. Still wearing it around school. Um, I like to wear it. I mean, sometimes it's a struggle to get my stuff in, but we make it work. <laughs> I forgot, Dr. Marlon. I know I told you today I was going to grab one of my way in. Oh, yeah. Only for, I, I did. I told her this morning. <laughs> I went home, but I still spaced it out. So It's okay. Next month. Yeah, right? Next month. Yeah. Questions or comments of student representatives? Just as always, great report. <laughs> Lot of enthusiasm. But thank you. Uh, okay, no, no actions needed on that one either. Okay, request on the new business. Uh, request for change. School store. Mr. Uh, Ruda mentioned uh, school store is preparing to open the den, so we're simply requesting the name be changed from the trading post uh, in our system. To the Den School Store. Resistance to it? Like the motion, we change the name to the school store. Motion, we have a second. Okay. Made in the second. Just to comment on that, on the question, uh, talking to a couple of members, uh, we thought it might be look more appropriate if it said the bad den. Than just the den. Uh, I kind of like the bears den better myself too. I'd like to ask the student representative for opinion is. Don't Please. Who you? Whatever you go with. Yeah. What is your feeling on? I'm just happy we have a school store. That's <laughs> It's kind of cool. I'm, I'm just walking by from like lunch or classes. I'm like, oh, that's a cute sweatshirt. Oh, that's a cute sweatshirt. Um, I don't really know. I mean, the den, the bear's den. I mean, I feel like, I feel like the den, it's kind of like implied that it's like the bear's den because like in Bedford, both like bears, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like implied that it's the den. Then, no, you put me on the spot here, Mr. Shea. I'm not supporting you. I, I agree with you. I think I, think I like the den because I feel like it's already implied that we're bears. You know what I mean? That's our school mascot. That's who we represent. So I feel like the den good. Like I won't show the audience. <laughs> I mean, I will help Sarah out here. I know Mr. O'Brien did meet with students last year when they settled on the den. I think that's where that name. I don't know, Mr. Ruda. Do you have any? So I, that's that's what happened. I know Mr. O'Brien. I know the letters students, and that's when they, it got to, to to us. But then, hence the, the sign. We have a 
motion a second to call it again? Yes. Yes. Vote. Nothing further on the question. Nothing further. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? So voted. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Cost money for the letters. If I don't know. <laughs> hey, take care uh, of your lunch. Mr. Watson, have a vote to approve the position, an LPN position. Did yeah. you get a comment on sure. that? Sure. So in your packets are a job description for an LPN. That is a grant funded position through ESSA 3. So your approval tonight won't, if approved, it won't be posted tomorrow. We need to await the approval of the funding on the grant. So we have put money in the ESSA 3 grant for roughly 18 months for this position. So just so that we're really clear about this, this is a COVID-19 position, try to help streamline us through the pandemic for the next 18 months. Uh, if the position were to remain beyond that, uh, this is one of those moments we talked about. This is sustainable position requires us to identify sustainable funds to be able to to cover that so that is not the case right now this is not a position that we funded the general appropriation it's going to be grant funded that means is when the grant expires position goes away unless we're able to fund it through existing revenue streams so uh, just so that we're a hundred percent transparent before we take one step on it plan at this point for an lpn in that office for 18 months to get us through the COVID pandemic, funded through the federal as a three grant. Motion to approve this position as it as a grant position for the next eighteen months. Second. Made and seconded. Question on the question. Yes, I'm very good. Why is it strictly for an LPN? Like if an RN applies for it, she can't have it. She, she could apply for it. Uh, the the pay is more in the LPN realm. No, an RN would be eligible to apply for the job. It's just that the funding for it is not a, is not in there for uh, registered nurse salary. So if they were interested, they would certainly be considered. They'd be a highly qualified applicant. Duties and responsibilities are the same. Correct. You are right. Yeah. Okay. Anything further on the question? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Voted. Okay, moving right along. Uh, vote to approve change in job titles. Yep. So in your packet of the 6C are the two administrative assistant principal to the principal and to the executive director for operations and compliance. As you know, uh, during the transition, principal model and Mr. Watts assumption of the, of the job title of executive director for operations and compliance for the district. Two folks in the main office who are administrative assistants to the CBTE principal and to the academic principal. Obviously, those positions no longer exist. So we are re-describing those positions to support the work of our new principal, Mr. Williams, as well as the confidential work, Mr. Watt, as the executive director of operations and compliance uh, for the district. So in there are the two job descriptions uh, to support those endeavors. Motion be in order to Move. Okay. Seconded. Anything on the question? Just to make it clear for so people that are out there that this is not two new positions. It's not. It's creating the correct order of what they're actually doing. It is aligning the two admin assistant jobs in the main office with the two administrators now yeah. working in the main office. Very similar to what we had CVT and academic, just with their new responsibility. Further on the question. In favor? Aye. Opposed? Voted. Mr. Watson again. Yeah. So, the, substitute pay. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank Ms. Stewart for her work in analyzing substitute pay both across the district uh, from our sending districts as well as regional uh, vocational schools in our area. Uh, in your packets uh, is a recommendation for us to uh, adjust substitute pay rate for the district. Existing rates of roughly $95, no degree, and 110 with a degree, $120 flat fee uh, for this school year. As I spoke with Dr. Marlin and, and, Mrs., and Mr. Toomey ahead of time, we would revisit this in the spring. Um, again, so this would be a for the duration of the COVID 19 pandemic. We did a caveat. I would direct Mrs. Fredette to make a note of that um, in the springtime. This may be a permanent change. 
half of the district, but I think what makes sense for us to do right now is to make sure that we are competitive in today's market for recruiting subs. We are making progress. I know this has been difficult for our teachers as well. We have 23 active subs, six of whom have just begun work this month. There are 11 additional substitutes at varying states of the application process from coming in to meet with HR to Corey and fingerprinting to final approval. We are hopeful that by the end of the month, we will have 35 substitutes active and engaged on a regular base, basis with the district. I think this new rate will also help uh, to motivate uh, folks to make sure that they stay with us during this pandemic uh, and hopefully also attract additional candidates in a competitive market for substitutes um, if needed. This is a problem across the board. I just want folks on the committee and people who are watching to know that we are doing everything that we can and attract additional folks into the substitute pool. Motion. Motion, do we have a second? Substitute being. Second. Motion made a second. Another question, Dr. Miles. So, I mean, I think this, the report was extremely well written and um, very comprehensive. I think it's a very important thing. I, I think that to support the teachers and and the school itself to have committed substitutes. So I, I think it's a, a great way to go. Further than the question. Oh, no further comments. All those in favor? All right. Most so voted. Okay. Uh, Stuart. Equipment is surplus. Yeah. Uh, we just have one item this month if you see and see the ladies that was um, submitted by Mr. Beth, Mr. Lucier and Academy V. This lady, the computer drive no longer works. He did put in an FMX for uh, the IT department to review it and it cannot be repaired. So the entire thing needs to go on surplus, which will be offered to the sending community and the other vocational schools that may want. Should you approve? Second. Motion. Those in favor? Aye. Those so voted. For personal appointments and retirements. Receive the place on file. Motion to receive and place on file. Move. Second. Motion made second. And the question. But you can't get a letter that says, I may do this, I may do that, depending on what the state legislature does. It's going to be. I agree. I've had a conversation. I did, did include this in the packet as Mr. Garvin asked me to. This was kind of caught in the changeover with Mr. O'Brien and myself. You'll note the date on that letter compared to some of the others, which have now been signed and dated by me. Um, I don't believe that bill is going anywhere. I think this will be a moot point. I have spoken to several state legislators. I it, it may. I, you obviously can't predict or control what the state government is going to do. Um, we did talk. Mrs. Fredette reached out on my behalf uh, last week to Mr. Garvin, and we informed him that a definite decision would be needed by February first uh, on, on this on this regard. And so um, it didn't happen widespread. No one else put in that kind of notice. Um, I, I agree with Mr. Durgan and moving forward, uh, any retirement letters that come to my office will specify a, a specific retirement date. And my point being is the whole idea of this is to give us a chance to hire somebody. Based on Correct. If we hire somebody, what do we tell them? Well, certain legislature go ahead. Yep. That's fair. Mm -hmm. The February date, because that's when you would probably advertise that's it? That's correct. So I think right now they're you're not going to do anything in December, or January. I'm not. So I, I think you know I like the idea of having a committed date before, like Randy said, you can't advertise something you can't do. So if that's okay with you to wait to that February first, you don't hear from them, then it's either off or on. Yeah, and so we, and Maria will reach back out. This was agreed in this particular case as we stumbled across this during the transition and the closure. Uh, where this letter was put in, I want to honor it. I want to respect uh, the teacher's wishes if they decide to, in fact, retire. There will be no movement on the position before the winter and spring. 
So we can afford to wait this one out and, and not create an issue that doesn't need to be created. Uh, but that said, Mr. Durrigan's point is well received. And I think if folks are going to submit a retirement letter, it is prudent that to access the benefit that's embedded within the contract, they should provide notice at the time and date. So on prudence, are we screwing you up by doing it? We just approved because there's been an understanding going on. Right. As you'll as long as you're comfortable with it. I am comfortable with this arrangement, and I think I hope I'm being clear about what my position is moving forward, that I will be signing them all, dating them all. Uh, on receipt. So. Further comments, questions? Hearing no further comments or questions, all those in favor? Opposed? So voted. Okay, informational. We have a letter from the Massachusetts Nurses Association, and we also have the Treasurer's report. At this time, I'd like to call on, call on Mr. Bruce Oliveira to. Clarify the, the report. Questions about the dual numbers in there. Let me go from here if everybody's okay. Yeah. The reason I gave you a report in this form, normally we just pick one day. Normally we pick just one day. Okay. But where uh, Mr. O'Brien had left and Mr. Watson took over, I wanted to show you that June 30th date. See as a set of numbers, and then we brought you up to August 31st of this year. That's why you have the two sets you have the June 30th number where we stood financially, and then you have the August 31st number. You know, and, and the rest of it's uh, generally uh, informative. I, I believe you do have it in your pack. Yeah. Data on the funding from the uh, sending communities. Matter of fact, I believe we just received one community this week. Today. We're receiving that. Okay. And um, the PCOT, which is your OPEP funding account, you see where that is $187,330.90. Could be to $350, so that accounts done fairly well over this. Actually, it's been about a five year time because I think first time we did three contributions at once. So I didn't know if you had any other specific questions, but that's why this one a little more involved than normal. Going forward, I'll just pick a date. Questions of Mr. Oliveira. Thank you. Motion be in order to approve his report. Make that motion. Should made. Second. Yeah. Made and seconded. Question. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. A committee discussion. Any committee discussion? Model. So um, I know that uh, Mr. Williams did mention this about the gazebo and darkness, but I just wanted to talk just for a minute about how significant this was and what it means to our town that the students are out there doing service and they're doing what they've been trained to do. And um, very, very positive feedback from the community. Um, with them was uh, Jeff Fortin, Frank Gonzalez, Steve Walker, also working on that team. And Sarah is going to say who some of the students were. <laughs> this is her class, <laughs> her senior class. Go ahead, Sarah. Uh, so starting off with Marcus Britton, Nicholas De Delaire, Ty Fernandes, William Lainez, Ashton Machado, Jefferson Morales, Donovan Pina, Devin Sanchez, Corey Spardella, Dante Williams, Kyle Langlois, Kevin Ayella, Genesis Cartega Nunes, Ava Emkins, Jesenia Furtado, Jeremiah Galanio, Morgan Hancock Madonka, Kristen Lopes, and Ashton. There's no last name, but Ashton. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Great job. So we just really the town really appreciates their efforts and and it's a it's a real service. Um, I know that they thought they were on the job, but it's certainly a great service project. Any other comments or discussion? Any discussions? 
Okay. Is that, uh, any other business might come before us? Okay, at this time, I will open the meeting up to public discussion. I believe we have one lady to speak. Shepard Lomba. Yes. <laughs> it's just me. Good evening. I'm speaking for UIA, Renee Lefetta, Union Superintendent Watson, members of the New Bedford Independent Vocational School Committee. Oh. You hear me? Yep. I'm also wondering maybe what we can do is have her sit yeah. out here so you can be in the camera as well. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> See you over there. I want everybody to be able to. She moves. I'm the woman that you call the name. Rhea Schiffer Lomba, the director of UIA. So seats. I'm speaking time to Renee, who's the president of our board. You're welcome to sit over there as well if you'd like. We only have three minutes. <laughs> so, good evening again. Um, as I stated, I'm Renee Ledbetter. I am a New Bedford community member, the vice president of the NAACP New Bedford branch, the director of the New Bedford Shannon Youth Program, and a leader in United Interfaith Action in Southeastern Massachusetts, also known as UIA. For several years, UIA has worked in the statewide vocational educational Justice Coalition to make the admissions policies of vocational schools more equitable. In June, the State Board of Education passed regulations holding each district accountable for constructing admissions policies that are non discriminatory and meet civil rights standards to be submitted October 31st. Until now, vocational schools had the option of either a lottery or ranking students by grades, attendance, Discipline and council recommendations, an option of student interview. Each vocational school chose to rank students, though this is not allowed in other public schools. Bessie's own data shows the ranking system has resulted in disparities between who is admitted with the effect of less admission of students of color, English language learners, economically disadvantaged, and students with special needs. I can bear witness to a system of ranking admissions putting up barriers to a vocational education. My son wanted to attend the school to be a mechanic because his grades were only average and he had some conduct issues, his application was denied. Similar to my son, I work with youth in the Shannon program who face many challenges like homelessness, hunger, deaths of family members and friends, working long hours to help support their family. As a result, they, may not have the best grades or the best attendance. Yet these youth can benefit from the most education. They may not excel in traditional academic settings, but thrive in hands-on learning environment. Getting into vote can change the direction of a young person's life and career. Under the current admissions policy, life opportunities for our students are being determined by grades and conduct in middle school challenging age for most. Currently, some students know they will not rank high enough, so they do not apply. Others do apply and get denied. We are here tonight as UIA to ask that your new admissions policy no longer have a point-based ranking system, but allows any student who meets standards to progress to a regular high school to have an equal opportunity to attend this school. Alternatives suggested include a lottery system or a percentage of seats dedicated to youth in protected classes. We ask that your new vocational admissions policy removes any unnecessary barriers to access the opportunity of vocational technical education. UIA also welcomes further conversation and input as you craft your new policy. We'd also like to congratulate you on your successes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Comments will be taken into consideration. Mr. Watson, as you probably know, we are in the process of uh, having an admissions policy developed, admissions policy being developed with the state. 
three or four meetings already. To me, if I may, first of all, thank you very much for coming out tonight and expressing feelings on this. I, I received the letter today and I thank Mrs. Fredette for drawing it to my attention very quickly. So I will be reaching out through Mrs. Fredette to schedule the meeting you requested with Principal Williams and myself. Uh, we will schedule that meeting in the next seven to 10 days. So in the next week or so, we'll schedule that meeting. As the Toomey mentioned, we are in the final stages. It's actually in legal review currently uh, proposed uh, amendments to our uh, admissions policy, which the full committee will weigh in on either later this month or at our November session. Uh, there will be community engagement and participation in a review of that following the first read of this. There, they should be able to look at the policy, offer feedback uh, and, and changes to that pending legal, legal guidance uh, before a final read is put forth. In spirit of full transparency, I just want to let you know that I did apply for an extension to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to make sure that we were able to give this a thoughtful consideration, both at the committee level and with engaged community members. That request was approved. I put a target date of no later than approval at our December 14th meeting with submission of materials by Friday, December 17th, and pledged that no student will be admitted to the class of 2026, although applications are being submitted until a new admissions policy can be utilized for that process. Okay. Public comments. Okay, at this time, then we'll be adjourning to executive session under chapter 30, section 21 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining through the Greater New Bedford Educators Union, to discuss strategy with respect to the collective bargaining with the Greater New Bedford Administrators Union, and to consider the purchase and exchange lease or value of real estate related to the expansion of the school facilities. As the chair has determined that an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the committee. Members will not be returning to open session. We need a motion at this time to go into executive motion session. One executive session. I made motion made and seconded. Roll call vote. This is for that. Is it Durgan? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Gary six to nothing. Aye. 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 <laughs> Sarah votes, right? Keep looking, Sarah. <laughs> You're getting up here. You're getting up on the other so To adjourn the regular session. So moving. We're not coming back in. All right, so moving. Motion, second. Yeah. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed, so voted. We will now move into executive session.